So I guess I always like to start off with a little bit like, who is Eric and what do you want people to know about you? Oh, that's a very open-ended. Well, <laughs> um, Eric is a journalist living in Toronto. Uh, I edit a few podcasts, some that your listeners might, or your viewers, this is a video podcast, sorry, um, your viewers might be familiar with. I edit Tech Won't Save Us, Paris Marks. We I talk edit- about that a lot. <laughs> it's a great show. I'm like, yeah. I'm so happy I get to be a part of it and kind of like just that, like hitch myself to that rocket ship that's just taking off. You know? it's, such a, <laughs> right? it's such a cool show. I'm very, very happy to be a part of that one. Um, sure. I also edit Press Progress Sources, which is a okay. great interview show. I think Press Progress is one of the newsrooms in this country that does uh, consistently punch above its weight. Like I nice. think they get incredible scoops. It's a small newsroom. Everybody there is a pro. Um also, very happy to be in the room with those talented people as well, sure. right? I host a podcast with two of my buddies uh, who are both in the media world, uh, Marino Greco and Jeremy Appel, who is a journalist out in Edmonton. It's called Big Shiny Takes, and we read the worst columns we can find in Canadian newspapers in the, you know, the remaining Canadian newspapers, which all seem to, you know, be getting worse consistently. So we're never all short on content. <laughs> Yeah, all three of them. Yeah. Well, it's like if you go national newspapers, we've got the Globe and Mail and like the Epoch Times, you know, like it's, a, it's like it's like oh, really that's bad thin. news. Yeah, I, know. I know it's brutal. Well, I guess the National Post counts as a newspaper still. So um, we do a lot of reading of the National Post. Post Media is the largest newspaper chain in Canada. It's explicitly conservative. Uh, yeah. And the ideas like they just keep lowering their standards as the years right. go on. And I. I thought they would like, you know, at least change up the the formula, but it's just been the same stuff for four years and it's, you know, just getting dumber every year. Yeah. I don't, I, I am not one who reads editorials. I, I like, I, I like, I like to read facts. I don't, I don't like no, less than opinions. So. Yeah. Well, I think honestly, that is like good self care to not read the opinion <laughs> sections of newspapers. But like we're we're kind of masochists, right? Yeah. Um, Marino used to work as a copy editor at a at a shop that would do um, a lot of the copy editing for uh, major newspapers in oh, okay. Canada, and like we just kind of extended this. It's kind of like a, a permanent punishment for uh, his life in media, right? Like Jeremy and I and Marino were just friends in journalism school, we would just always share the worst columns we could find and laugh and read them together. And it's like, it's our way of like knowing what's going on in newspapers without um, letting it damage us emotionally. Right. Yeah. Like, some of it's awful, you know, like it's just like, it's surprising. Well, I like I listen to Big Shiny Takes regularly, so I get my feel of editorial content <laughs> from that. <laughs> Yeah, we're uh, we're trying to take the hits so other people don't have to. Yeah, you know? that's like, right. Uh, I, like for anybody who hasn't listened to it before, I think one of the the last one that we recorded was actually quite fun. It's a Joe Warmington column. Who Joe is like one of the the worst to ever do it, but he he did a column about how communism was alive and well in Oakville, and uh, I have I mean I I don't think I've listened to that one yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's fascinating and what what for people who aren't from the gta oakville is like an incredibly wealthy suburb of toronto um it's actually surely the hub of maoism right (laughs) (laughs) yeah exactly a lot of third worldists and stuff uh it's like the mayor is uh the like the former founder of ytv lots of money in this town um they had a uh walkout where a bunch of high schoolers from White Oak Secondary walked over to Oakville Town Hall okay. to protest uh, protest the town because they refused to make a statement on uh, ongoing um, violence in Gaza, right? Ah, yep. And uh, and the students, I mean, the young people, you know, they seem to be with it at least more than their parents, right? Um, they at least get it, yeah. Yeah, they went to protest, and then someone gave Joe Warmington a tip that uh, there were hundreds of communists outside of town hall. <laughs> and so he went there, and that's what he covered. He didn't really talk about what they were protesting. Of course not. What was going on. <laughs> hey, it's shocking. The, there's no standards. It, uh, it's funny. Like, I used to, I guess, <clears throat> you hear, like, uh, what was that? Rex, Rex Murphy? Yeah, I used to occasionally read his stuff, and you go, like, 
okay, so he's just a liar, right? Like, <laughs> like so how can it be worse than that? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, I mean, I, I'd hate to speak ill of the dead, right? But Rex, <laughs> Rex's okay. columns were so stupid, right? Um, there was like a four year streak where every time there was a snowfall, like there are the first snowfall of the year, you'd write a thing like, oh, it's freezing out. Uh, the carbon mm. tax must be working. And it's like, how many times, how many times can you write this like slob and have yeah. people still come back for more? Like you're, you're costing your own newspaper subscriptions with this stuff. Like, I don't know. The I'm confirmation sure bias is very strong in the public. <laughs> yeah, like I'm sure it's like cathartic to reread the hits like that. You know, it's like yeah. hearing an old song. But I mean, on the other on the other hand, people don't like being treated like they're stupid. That's and true. Some sometimes I wonder if that has anything to do with the fact that you know newspapers are flailing the way that they are these days. I almost wouldn't doubt it. Like, you get where, like, uh, so you can't get news on Facebook anymore, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people that may have read papers wouldn't, can't get their news that way. They were getting it from Facebook and now they can't. So now they got to go back to, like, websites and stuff. But, like, they're still not going back to newspapers anymore. Yeah, exactly. And, I mean, when the product that is offered to them in this country is, um, you know, columns by you know winners like joe warmington and formerly rex murphy like i don't blame them for not going back um yeah i'm, I'm actually <clears throat> glad you brought up c18 the bill c18 which is oh, why yep. you know uh news is banned on facebook products <laughs> uh, the last uh the last few months i've been working on a project with a bunch of independent journalists or independent news organizations um it's a decentralized website called Unrigged, where we just we have a news aggregator of about 20 independent um, news organizations, latest cool. stories, and you head over to there, sign up to, for the newsletter. If you're looking for news content, it still exists, I promise you. Uh, it's <laughs> nice. harder to find, but we're trying to make it a little bit easier. So yeah, unrigged.ca is the, the website. Nice. nice. I actually, I, I pay for a yearly subscription to Grounded news or whatever it is that app that's supposed to like give you the biases of each side or whatever and show you the blind spots i i'm not sure i find it actually represents the left in any way that i uh, <laughs> that i know of but it's it's tough right like media literacy people always like everyone's like oh you know these kids have to be media literate and stuff but it's like is anyone Right. Like it's a very difficult thing because you need to know the personal biases of the writers. You need to know who's editing the paper. You need to know where it's being published. You yeah. have to sort of see their motivations. People are all, you know, <laughs> like um, we were talking about this earlier, but it's like it's very easy to have an incoherent worldview. Right. And so some people yeah. in the media, I'm not I'm not saying <laughs> I'm not naming names. Some people are hard to pin down because they seem to like not really have any real beliefs. They're just saying right. What, they either picked up in the in the lunchroom or whatever their boss told them as well, right? Yeah, yeah. I have this, and not to speak ill of the people I work with, but I have this experience at my job all the time where people, they're simply just reciting something they heard from someone. Like this capital gains tax thing. Like they're just like, now they're taxing capital gains at 67%. I'm like, but that's not true. <laughs> like that's not how that works. <laughs> like, and, like, and even if it was, it's like, man, you made like 45 grand last year. You know what I mean? Right. Like I, like the people who are mad about it are not the people that are, are, you know, taking the hit on this right. one. And the people who are taking the hit kind of, they can handle a few. They, <laughs> yeah, they actually right. should be hit more. We yeah. should take more from them. How, are, just, how, <laughs> how are capital gains not a hundred percent of them? eligible for taxation <laughs> exactly it's like how am i supposed to feel bad for someone who is having more taxed away from them in in a year because they made like over a quarter of a million on a single investment or whatever right um than i did in the entire year like how am i supposed to find space in my heart for that there are oh, other things them. i care about right <laughs> yeah yeah it's like i i weep for them i weep for their their healthy portfolio but yeah again they <laughs> I think they're going to be okay. They're they're actively out there avoiding taxes as much as they can. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not going to shed any tears over anybody who has a an account in the Cayman Islands. You no, know? 
<laughs> no, that's right. So, so weird. So not only do you get it wrong, but you're also defending people that have no interest in helping your life in any way. They're just taking out of our pockets. Yeah, yeah, it is like, it's a weird thing because I think part of it is some people are are missing that sort of class consciousness of like, oh, you know, if we work together, maybe we could make things better for uh, the people in our community, right? Yeah. Um, I think sometimes that's missing. I think there's a, there's a little bit of a gap in, you know, awareness of your own situation being um, similar to the people in the same economic uh, <laughs> class as you. Um, yeah. We're very atomized, I think. And I think some people, I'm not saying... I'm not saying any names, but I think some people have been uh, tricked <laughs> into supporting things that are actually working in the uh, like are working against their self interest. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's. I mean, I work in the oil field, so that's the whole thing is propagandized. People who somehow have been convinced that worshiping these multi millionaire or multi billion dollar international companies. Uh, is going to get them a raise or something. It's going to make their lives better somehow. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, it's like, it's, they don't want to be your friend. They want you to not hate them so they can keep buying boats. Right. Like it's, yeah, it's yeah. Well, sad. I don't know. I guess without going too into detail, we in, in my area, we did everything we could to cater to a specific company. Mm -hmm. And, and then this last two years, that company, has sold off a bunch of its assets, changed its name, and then moved all of its production to Alberta. <laughs> After all the stuff we did to placate them. <laughs> and you go, yeah, they weren't for, I, here for us. <laughs> yeah, and then they, they say things like, oh, you know, it's just business. But if you did anything that was in your own self-interest, like you yeah. guys would be these... Um, these <laughs> troublemakers that were just looking to, you know, affect a small business, right? Like you're, yeah, you know, yeah, a small destroying. business. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. it's like, I don't know why we frame things the way that we do, because um, this business will not have any sort of hit to their reputation. They're going to be fine in Alberta. Right. Like, yep. and I don't yep. even know this specific situation. I just but feel very confident be. saying this. They're going to be fine. They yeah. spend like a couple hundred bucks on a new logo. They yeah. just slap it on the, on the side of their trucks and uh, they're good to go. Yep. That's right. It's absurd. But we're all supposed to, you know, still worship at the altar, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, I, I mean, business is never going to love you back. Right. Like, I mean, I think I think it's a pretty safe safe thing to say on your podcast, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> all work is uh, yeah. I mean, we're not doing it out of love when we're working for somebody else, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I guess uh, what are some of your least or most favorite columnists that you take you cover on Big Shiny Takes? Oh, that's it's weird. It's weird actually doing a show where we highlight the worst podcasts or like not worst podcasts, worst columns. Um, but there are people that I've I've developed like a soft spot for just because they're like um, <laughs> incomprehensible. They're bad. OK, like, I think one of my favorites is Joe Warmington. And oh, yeah, he's a he is, you know, just like a Toronto icon. He's. He gets himself into such weird situations. I'm sure you're like familiar with the Dominion voting scandal oh, uh, yeah. with the American election. He found himself embroiled in that because he went for a late night walk after uh, Trump lost the election. And Dominion Voting Systems has an office somewhere in Toronto. He was walking around really late at night, took a photo of the building and then noticed that the lights were on. <laughs> <laughs> on a certain floor and he's like why are all the lights on in the dominion voting system space or in the offices what are they doing they weren't doing anything uh Obviously. lights were on it was a different floor it, he counted the floors <laughs> wrong the dominion voting system wasn't on that floor um that didn't matter people were looking for a reason to say that the election yeah. was stolen et cetera, et cetera. we don't need to get into american politics uh but, <laughs> but yeah, yeah it's like that's the kind of stuff that joe gets himself into sometimes and it's like uh, baffling. Like, yeah, I don't know how strange. he manages to. Yeah. How did, how, yeah. Like he's just making an assumption based on, cause he just feels of a certain vibes or whatever. It's, it's hard to tell. Right. Like I think, I think everyone's a little bit guilty of like reverse engineering 
things sometimes. Like you yeah. feel a specific way and then like the way your brain is working, it's like it's trying to aim towards a specific conclusion. Yeah. Um, I think he's all, he's a little bit guilty of making some some leaps, but also he's just like he's an uncareful <laughs> He's an uncareful reformer. He's just not careful. Yeah. Um, he was yeah. he, like in that Oakville town hall story, he kept calling it city hall. And, and I mean, easy mistake to make. And it's a little pedantic to be like, well, Oakville is a town, not a city. But like on the outside of Oakville town hall in gigantic white letters, it says Oakville town hall. And it's like, <laughs> you're a reporter. It's also you an should... easy mistake not to make. <laughs> it's like, yeah, as easy as it is to uh, make that mistake, a small correction goes a long way, right? Yeah. Um, he he does very interesting things too in that same story. For some reason, he wanted to let everybody know that he had a gas-powered car. So he's like, so I drove over to Oakville in my gas-powered car. And I, I think that's adorable. You know, I don't understand why he did that. I don't <laughs> know what he's saying about it's the electric just that vehicle. anti-electrical vehicles, yeah. Yeah, I don't know what it has to do with the story. Maybe it's just a quick dig at every electric car that's ever existed. I guess. It doesn't really do a whole lot, but okay. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. Virtue signaling. <laughs> yes, that's essentially. <laughs> like, but it's like it, the fact that it didn't fit into the story. Because like all of these guys do virtue signaling, really. Yeah. Like if, yeah. we, if we break down what that means, they get really upset if you call it that. But of it's course. like – it's always like signifying that they're on the winning team, right? They're like, yeah. I don't care for this woke stuff. And you're like, you're doing a story about, <laughs> about something completely different. Why are you saying that? Also, how <laughs> yeah. does how's an electric car woke? Like, what is that? What is, I don't know. Yeah, that's right. Because everything I don't like is woke. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which, isn't it exhausting living in that world where like, oh, just yeah. like. <laughs> uh, yeah, because yeah, you're out in the oil field. You said that. Um, I'm sure you deal with that a lot on the day to day. Yeah, I, I, I'm not. I, I specifically tell people that I do not talk politics at work because uh, I don't agree with any of them. I just say that's true. Everything you say is wrong to me, so let's not talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's always a fun game, and I do this sometimes. Like, I, I don't play hockey anymore. But when I was beer league, af after games you know, during like just having beers after the games, just try and slide in some ideas <laughs> once in a while. Just kind of like yeah. just test the waters, get them talking about material conditions. Yes. You know, like yep. see, see what Very happens. Sure. You know, yep. give them the vocabulary. If you teach them the language, maybe they'll they'll come around to, you know, thinking about things a little more critically, right? Or or uh try and use some of the language that they're used to, like the elites or mm. <laughs> or like, yeah, those <laughs> Those rich fat cats over and yeah, wherever, yeah, yeah. like, yeah, they, they don't care about us. Why should we care about them? Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. Like, um, it is like one of those interesting things where a lot of people that I know that are right of center uh, generally think of elites as people who have cultural cachet. And maybe it's because right. they don't specifically have that. Whereas I think more people who are left and working class they think of the elites as people who have capital or access yeah. to capital, right? Yeah. Like people who actually have money and can can actually shape the world around them based on, you know, their actual desires. But for some reason, to someone who has, you know, a, a mortgage, a summer home and three cars in the garage, just like some teenager on Twitter who can dunk on them anytime they say anything mean <laughs> um, yeah. is is the cultural or is the elite in the situation. Yeah, somehow, right? yeah. Yeah, it's funny. It's funny because uh, you can talk to people and they'll like in some ways they really get it. Right. Like they're like, yeah, it's it's really tough out here for everybody. And I'll, I'll always bring up Galen Weston and I'll always bring up like <laughs> the food food prices, which I you said you uh, we, you can talk on some. But I, I always bring these things up and I'm like, yeah, like you and I are like effectively making the same or less money than we did three years ago. But so on, like, like Galen Weston, the profits at uh, Loblaws are record profits every quarter. Just so, so what's going on there? It's not, it's not inflation anymore, is it? <laughs> it? Exactly. Inflation has been cooled for a very long time. Food prices went up at the, at the end of 2022 through to 2023. And, <laughs> and people are just like, um, what? Our wages didn't go up. <laughs> um, and what I find so interesting is that these stores, their profits also went up. And so to me, what that indicates is that all the increased margin 
that went with inflation because, um, you know, gas gets more expensive, transportation gets more expensive, everything gets more expensive, right? Um, but because their profits <laughs> either stayed at the same level or increased, it means all those extra costs just got offset on us. Like yep. We just paid the bill. Yeah, Isn't that incredible? That's right. And then, and then they're like, yeah, and they're like, well, it's the supply chain. It's like, was it the supply chain? Because if you <laughs> if you look at the, the consumer price index for food and yeah. everything else at the same time, food was increasing at twice the rate as everything right. else. Yeah. So, I mean, it wasn't everything, right? Yeah, clearly, clearly, it wasn't just the supply chain. Yeah, yeah, I like, and of course, yeah, the supply chain it has something to do with it. Sure, it always does, right? Because it exists. <laughs> you know, like we yeah, have to, that's right. we are not dismissing the notion of the supply chain, <laughs> but we're also not dismissing the fact that businesses only exist to make money. And when they see an opportunity, they're probably going to take it, yeah. um, which we can see in their quarterly earnings. Right. That's right. Yeah. That's <laughs> it's right. going up. Uh, and I, I, it also if, like I think of like, so why aren't the wages part of that supply chain? How come the wages haven't gone up? Because your laborer needs to you know, survive in order to be a, a fa- efficient worker. So what's going on there? But, yeah. No, sorry. You, you keep going. No, I, was, uh, no, I was just, yeah. But they don't but, seem to give a shit, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I always feel like businesses just, they get away with exactly as much as people allow them to, right? Um, when wages go up, it's usually because of some sort of labor action, right? Yeah. It's like people are collectively bargaining for new, like better wages or better conditions. And, like we just we narrowly avoided a subway strike here in Toronto, and like that wasn't even really about wages. Everyone's like, well, they get paid well, so or they get paid so well, et cetera, et cetera. But like, I mean, it's one of the most dangerous jobs in the city. Like every every yeah. TTC employee has like a story about you know being assaulted. It's horrible. Um, right. But like, I had a conversation with David McDonald from the CCPA when I started this grocery tracker project, which I've been doing for the hoser for about 10 months now um, where we're tracking the price of groceries in the city. And what David was saying to me was like, okay, like it's not just food prices, it's housing. Housing is causing food price increases to affect us more personally. Right. Um, And when you're, you're given the choice between spending less on groceries and not having an apartment anymore, like, you know what you're going to choose. But then on top of that, it's the fact that our wages haven't moved at all. And yeah. the way that we get out of a problem like this is either we we hope for the the economy to completely implode, which we shouldn't hope for because that uh, causes uh, a, a lot, lot of, of suffering, yeah, <laughs> a lot of suffering, a lot of uh, not great moments in people's lives, um, or we bargain for better wages, right? We get yeah. paid more, and I think that's that's the solution to this is that people need to be paid more. Yeah. I, I hate giving a blanket solution to something that's quite complicated yeah but i do think there's no way that can make things worse at this point I, yeah because i i always like i talk about this with a lot of people actually because ultimately the profit the the profits have to go down at some point we have to have some of that money circulating through ourselves and through the things we buy and and whatnot and then that has to go back into the economy like you can't just sit in some bank account somewhere and rot and then they wonder like <laughs> they wonder why inflation happens, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I I love hearing the argument that we can't pay workers more money because that'll cause inflation. It's like, I'm sorry, <laughs> what? <laughs> like, what, the, yeah. what do you think is happening here? Um, yeah, I, I agree wealth hoarding is bad. I don't like the idea of um, there being more billionaires in the world just sitting on piles of gold which is the way I I envision it. It it makes it a little (laughs) less uh, unsettling to think about just people with untold amounts of wealth. While uh, I've got, I've got two encampments on my street, you know, like there's the, the social stratification in this country is gone. um, Absolutely wild in the last five years alone. Right. And food insecurity is huge. Yeah. Um, There was a stat, gets thrown around uh, by Proof, which is a uh, a group out of the University of Toronto that said in 2022, one in five children in Ontario faced food insecurity, Jeez. which is devastating. Yeah, Devast- it, like, it can slow down development. It's, um, it's very unhealthy to be, you know, um, malnourished as a child. 
Food insecurity yeah. is, is like a serious issue. And then people are, you know, complaining about the capital gains tax to me, not to bring it yeah. back to that. Thing. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, for sure, though, because that is what it is. Like instead of it's also because of all the, you know, decades and decades of propaganda that people have absorbed over. Like so people who live on the street, it's because they failed in some way. That's because they're a bad person or what have you. And it, rather than extend, so then rather than extending empathy to someone who's living on the street, somehow they've got this more empathy for like the businessman who, you know, makes a million dollars or whatever. And they mm -hmm. go, oh, well, you can't take, he earned that. He worked hard for it. You can't take that out of his pocket. Yeah. But it's wow. like when you look at it, you, yeah, I, I totally understand the sentiment. Um, it's like this weird, like um, morality attached to it. Right? Yeah. Like, um, it's like you are suffering because you did something to deserve that, which is an incredibly fucked up way of thinking yeah. about the world, right? Um, I do think that <laughs> that there is something very annoying about like the, oh, he earned his money. It's like, oh, what did he do? It's like, oh, he made Uber for jackets. <laughs> you can rent a jacket from this guy. And uh, it's attached yeah. to a ripcord and you can, you can take it at the station and you just walk and when you're done, you let go and it just, the quarter tracks and you yeah, that's and right. it's like, nobody needs that. <laughs> nobody needed that ever. Why are yeah. we, why are we talking about this? Why does he deserve that money? And that person has to sleep out in the cold. Why is yeah. that? Why do you think that's fair? Yeah. In what way does that make sense? And, it's, and what are like, and, and of course there's all these kinds of aspects to it. Like people used to say before she went full turf, that JK Rowling was one of the only ethical billionaires because she got her money through book sales instead of some other exploitative process. And you go like, yeah, but there's still like people printing those books. There's still, you know, a whole production going on. And many of those people are probably underpaid so that she can make billions of dollars off of her book sales. Like it's just, it lacks like, I guess, a, a detailed analysis of what's actually happening. There, yeah, I think there is like a fundamental lack of analysis sometimes when people talk <laughs> about this stuff because I think part of them in their heart is like, I'm going to get there one day and I don't yeah. want to think about it. I don't want to yeah. think about all the necks I have to stand on to get to where I want to go. Yeah. Right. Um, I know some people that have, have worked in publishing, not particularly lucrative. Right. Very hard. <laughs> right. You have to yeah. find you have to find people to write books. And a lot of those books aren't going to sell well. And yeah. you're not going to make a ton of money off of that. And it's like it's stressful. Right. Like, I mean, yeah. whatever. Like, I'm sure like when she was just writing kids stories and not being on tw Twitter 24 seven with a melted brain, um, it was easier to empathize with her because she wrote stories that um, right. you, know, you grew up with. But now I think of like hearing someone like refer to J.K. Rowling as an ethical billionaire is wild, <laughs> considering what she does with her platform these days. Yeah, you know? no kidding. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> if if you could ignore the the whole billionaire thing, there's nothing ethical about her behavior now, right? So yeah, yeah it's crazy. <laughs> Anything she's said after like 2007 is just yeah. like, oh my god, you were allowed to write <laughs> yeah. books for children. Like, what did you? Well, and then you learn more about like some of the symbology and stuff that's in those books, perhaps. And like, you go, holy shit, maybe those books aren't actually for kids. <laughs> like, maybe, you know, young people shouldn't be reading that and being influenced by it. No, there's like a thing that happens in one of the middle books. I feel like, I mean, it's a, it's a long series. Yeah. Um, and there's like a lot of fluff in there, but like, there's like some anti-union sentiment in it as well with like yep. the indentured servant elves. Yep. And then uh, one of them like makes a, a I, uh, Hermione makes a badge and it's just like talking right. about like these people should should be liberated. And the elves are like, no, no, no. We like being uh, <laughs> indentured servants, which yeah. is actually a really fucked up thing to put in your child's Super book. Super messed I, up. <laughs> <it's> <laughs> yeah, like, that's right. <laughs> like, hang on a second. We do not want to be treated like equals. No, no. <laughs> yeah. Wait a second. <laughs> Yeah. But yeah. So I guess, uh, I don't know if we got, I guess you said you have a, a soft spot for guys like uh, Joe Warmington. Uh, yeah. <laughs> who are, who are some of the other uh, columnists that you've covered? Uh, oh goodness. We've covered, if someone's got a, a column in post media paper, we probably covered them. Yeah. David Staples is an old favorite out in Edmonton. He kind of, he does the news, 
but he also covers the Oilers and he's wrong about both all the time. And I find that fascinating to be like a double threat like that. Just being like wrong, wrong. Like, you're I think wrong. that's cool. <laughs> like, like, you're wrong like, on sports and economics. <laughs> it's interdisciplinary uh, bad takes, which I right. think is like it's quite impressive because some people sure. are just bad at, at one topic. Right. One person that we cover a lot is uh, like an anti harm reduction activist called uh, at, his name's Adam Zevo. He's a what's not, what's an anti harm reduction <laughs> activist? So like, you know, like how how in the in the ongoing drug toxicity crisis across all of North America, um, a lot of people who um, have been, you know, very well versed in the subject for a long time say that um treatment based uh like or like like any sort of like harm reduction treatment which offers like safe supply um is like oh, objectively okay. like the safest yeah. way of uh of helping people who are in the midst of uh like a an addiction that is you know continuing on for a specific amount of time sorry i'm stumbling a little bit but uh his his take is like no that's that's the problem this thing that's saving lives is the problem and he's all he's all about abstinence based treatment and that kills people and now he's started like a little think tank about it it's it's fascinating to uh to witness when it's, i hear yeah when i hear anti harm reduction i'm like so he's he's pro pro harm, harm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, and that's not how he would frame it right he'd be like well actually no the the real people who are causing the harm are the harm reduction people oh it's like, yeah well it's like well i mean the name and the stats <laughs> don't back up <laughs> that uh that notion but yeah. thanks for coming out right that reminds me of like uh john gormley back when uh, i when i was a conservative in the early 2000s I listened to John Gormley a lot and he used to always talk about like safe injection sites and whatnot. And all, oh, you see all these needles all over the place. And of course there's all these people ODing at the safe injection site. And, and you go like at the time I was, yeah, oh, sure. It makes sense. But when you actually learn about it, it's like, well, that's just not how it works actually. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> so, it, it, it takes like a little bit of, well, a little bit. It takes a a whole heap of cognitive dissonance to be like, well, the the way that we should be doing it is uh, criminalizing it, so people yeah. are are taking these drugs on their own in yeah. remote locations. So if anything goes wrong, no one can. We don't help have to them see out. them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, this is this is the thing, right? It's it's the desire to invisibilize the problem is yeah. killing people. Yeah. And it's like. I've heard stories. I'm doing a, a story about uh, the displacement of homeless people through the encampment clearances okay. over the last couple of years in the city. Uh, Toronto is trying to change their approach to the way that they've they've handled encampments. Um, but 2021 was a really bad year for um, really violent clearances at mm. encampments. Um, a lot of tent cities popped up um, across North America during the pandemic because, I mean, a lot of people lost yeah. their jobs. Um, and people needed support, right? Um, it is fascinating and I like in a horrible way, um, how many stories I've heard of like how people were harmed as a result of these decisions to clear out these encampments. Yeah. Um, and it's like, it's a direct result of a policy choice that yeah. people have made. Um, yeah. just like, uh, it's killed people, right? Um, encampments. Yeah, for sure. It, I like I don't know if encampments are the the permanent solution. Like well, I think yeah. we should we should have, you know, actual actual housing for people. I think everybody does. Yeah, some, some sort of housing first kind of policy. <laughs> yes. Yes, um, I I think that um you know, everyone has a right to a house. I think it, housing is a human right. Yeah. Like period. Um but the community and the support that these people are receiving in encampments uh keeps them alive. And I know after the Lamport stadium eviction out in Parkdale in Toronto. This is a little Toronto inside baseball. Afterwards, um, encampment clearance, very traumatic event. Some people ended up using drugs. Um, and because they were no longer in a community with people who were aware, um, yeah. they ended up overdosing and dying. And it's like, oh, the city killed those people, in my yeah. opinion. Yeah, right? essentially. It's, it's yeah. heartbreaking. Yeah, it's not cool. Like, yeah, it's pretty shitty. I, I think of like... Uh, with our 
we had a, a homeless encampment and then there was a protest down by city hall here in Regina. And, uh, and then they kind of just shipped all those people. They grabbed all their stuff and they took them out to a, a, a town outside of the city. And then they kind of just left those people out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> like you go like, Oh, that's kind of shit. Like so, <laughs> what the just, fuck? Like just gather up all your stuff and being like, out you go. Out you go. You can't be in the city anymore. Yeah. That's wild. And it, I, I mean, the entire policy to do that, like, it just fits into the, the larger idea that they're, they're not looking to solve the problem. They're just trying to hide. It's all optics based, right? Like, yeah. They're not, <laughs> they're not looking to solve a thing. They'll spend more money trying to make it not visible. Yeah. Like the amount of money it takes to move an entire group of people to a different town. Like, <laughs> That's not a cheap thing. The no. city spent like millions of dollars on private security and overtime contracts for for cops, right? Right. Um, yeah. To for just sure. like to smash up an encampment, throw out all the stuff, and uh, beat up a couple protesters. Yeah. Like just to hurt people. Yeah. And yeah. It's like we could have just used that for something that would have made everyone's lives better, but I guess I, I guess that's not. too much work. Yeah, right? that's right. Whatever. It's like they they said. Uh, I think it was two or three years ago, the city council unanimously voted to end homelessness in Regina. But then, of course, when it comes time to like actually do something, oh, well, we got to do a investigative committee. We got to, you know, we got to put a, you know, we got to figure out the cost benefit analysis and all. Oh, it turns out it's going to cost too much money to do to actually fix homelessness in the city. It's, so instead, we'll buy the Regina police a fucking plane. <laughs> it's like can they live on the plane <laughs> like, like what, I, it, what are they what does regina police need a plane for but yeah that's I, a very good question <laughs> <laughs> it's like what do they need the plane for um oh my god because it's, saskatoon has a plane oh yeah it's yeah it's, so Corey has one so i need a plane too. <laughs> um this is infants i swear um i i do think like just announcing that you're gonna end homelessness like that in Regina is very similar to Ottawa declaring itself the shawarma capital of the country. Oh yeah. Like they just declared it. They unanimously voted for it. How did, like, they, did they? Wow. They just did it. They decided. And it's like, not one of them turned it down, which is, that upsets me. It's like, I feel like they need to go to more towns, you know? Yeah, um, that's right. <laughs> who, who, yeah. Who among the city council could be the voice that says, well, maybe we don't get to just say that. <laughs> Maybe we should earn the title, but yeah, it's, it's like city councils love declaring things, but like yeah. when they actually have to, when it's time to come and and come up with ideas and actually like roll up your sleeves and get to work, it's always, <laughs> always uh, like, oh wow, this is, this is way too much work. <laughs> on second thought. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, maybe we, we just say that we did it, right? Yeah, that's right. And, I mean, ship them out people. to a nearby town and... <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's success incredible and like I, I shouldn't you know speak too too uh glibly about it there are good people on toronto city council but i mean situation's getting worse not better right now so like we gotta yeah <laughs> we gotta yeah. get to work here you know yeah it's like uh i think i i can't say the numbers anymore i i had i had used to have the numbers of people who were uh homeless in Regina at the top of my head, but I can't think of it now, but like the numbers have gone up obviously over the last few years and, mm -hmm. and you go, well, so then something else has to be changed, right? Like we have to do some kind of policy that's going to maybe alleviate that pressure, F uh, find some way to get these people into homes or have better supports or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I wish that would ever happen. And in, instead of, uh, people using visible poverty as an excuse to raise the police budget. Right. right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like I'd say the last couple of years here, um, I feel like the only solution to anything, any, anything uh, conditions wise uh, was to give the cops more money. Yeah. Um, so the encampments um, resulted in the cops getting money. Uh, then when there were no more encampments and people we're riding the TTC to not freeze to death because all the shelters were over full. The TTC was no longer safe. 
We need mm-hmm. we need <laughs> we need more troops on this on yeah. the, the subway, right? And then, like we got all those wonderful uh, social media posts from the cops, including like the one guy with the the machine gun who's like oh, down geez. in the in the subway. I'm like, are you gonna open fire on someone on a subway? Like you're gonna what? Jesus! Like what do you need that for? Uh, it, it was listen, like it the subway has gotten like less safe. Like statistically, sure. it, obviously, like um, people are a little bit more desperate. You cut service, and uh, there's more time for um, you know untoward things to happen. Yeah, like and there was there was there were people that got killed on the subway. That's not good. Nope. Um, but there's yeah, but there's actual solutions to these things, right? <laughs> like, yes, <laughs> yes. And I don't think like just throwing a bunch of cops at a at a problem doesn't like I don't think it actually makes things go away. It, it, it never does. Yeah. It never, it yeah. only cops only ever escalate the situation as far as I can tell. It's, I think it's incredible that that like, I mean, when crime goes down here, we need more police. Uh, when crime goes up, we need more police. <laughs> um, it's just like, we don't think about it. And, Somehow. And, like, yeah. and I, people are afraid of being labeled as like some, some radical leftist activist, but it's like, I think we need to look at numbers. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Like, why are you booing me? I'm right about this. You exactly. Know? Like, it's, exactly. It's, it's unfortunate. I mean, maybe it's not unfortunate, but the, the stats, the truth, reality supports the radical left agenda on <laughs> policing. <laughs> that's that's sorry. where I came from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sorry that the statistics don't, um, don't say that you need another helicopter. I'm yeah. really sorry. It's like, the the issue is, is like the statistics don't really matter like i think yeah. the tpa has like city hall by the throat like they can they can yeah. get them to agree to any budget increase and i think it's very similar in every large city in north america yeah. police unions know how to get uh their line items in the budget they're very good at it yep for sure they yeah they've got like pretty major influence among even if they don't have the entire city council or the mayor like they have influence among enough of the city council and you know so it's yeah it was it was wild actually um during the mayoral race when Olivia Chow won she was the only candidate to not answer the Toronto Police Association's uh list of questions and then the amount of tears on the internet <laughs> that they they spilled over her not responding to their questions um, was, I mean, I thought it was very funny. Of but course, yeah. Like, come budget time after she wins the election, I mean, she she, she listened to them. Yeah, you know? no, I yeah. I think yeah. that they're they're a very difficult group to say no to professionally. But I would like to see someone say no to them one time. Be cool. <laughs> yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, it's like it makes me think of like a. Uh, in the U.S., after uh, when defund the police was actually proper or like popular for a little bit, mm-hmm. and like I think it was the New York Police Department was like, "We're just not going to police for a, a for a while," and everybody's like, "Yeah, right on, <laughs> just quit then." Like nobody, no, <laughs> we're better off. <laughs> uh, what's that? There's a Nick Mullen joke about that where it's just like, "Oh, so you hate the cops." Well, next time you get robbed, uh, call someone else to show up seven hours later and shrug, right? Like it's yeah, that's right. Like, exactly, it's, yeah. Uh, it's I don't know. I I don't fully understand why we we pour money into things that don't work and we can't. Then we can't possibly fund things that actually might work. But maybe that's why I'm not an elected uh, representative <laughs> of any that's municipality right. in this country. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah, you have more questions than uh, than the average <laughs> politician does, I guess. Uh, yeah. Well, I think I've taken your time for almost a full hour here. Um, so, is there anything that you want to talk about before you go? Oh well, first of all, I'd say like this has been a blast. I really appreciate you um, taking the time to talk to me. Um, I love talking. I love talking Canada <laughs> politics. Nobody ever wants to talk about it. Um, like, <laughs> yeah. or if they do, they're always like, you know, something, 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 5G, 
microchips and you're like, I don't want them. <laughs> Not you. Okay. You and I can't <laughs> talk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. I, you're like, I got to go. And you just like put your phone up to your ear. It's, it's been dead for a couple hours. You're just like, I need yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah it, it's, I think that, um, I don't know. I really enjoyed the topics that we covered. I think food prices are, are a thing that, I mean, they're going to, they're going to stay bad for quite a while um, until the businesses here take note of what they're doing in the States right now, which is cutting prices in order to win back customers because people have stopped going to these large stores because the prices have been so bad. Right. Um, yeah. Um, do, you, and do you think that would work here? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I, I think we, we lack competition here, but I don't think yeah. that like, I don't think the liberal government's uh, solution to bring in like one extra store is going to make a whole lot of difference. Right. Yeah. Right. Like I, I have some time for the, the Loblaws boycott people because they see like a, an actual structural issue and they go, okay, well you guys aren't doing anything about this. Like we will. Yeah. Um, like, and yep. I, I wrote about this and um, as someone who buys groceries, I feel, I feel invested in the story. Like, I, I don't know if I can have a, <laughs> I can have a completely objective take yeah. on it. Um, I would like to see prices go down. Um, I don't know if the boycott's going to be able to do it on its own, but I love the fact that people have seen an issue and then tried to deal with it um, sure. in a collective way, right? I think we need more of that in the country. I think people yeah. need to see these like these issues that they're dealing with in their own life as a thing that affects the people around them um, before we can get somewhere good, right? Like yeah. that's it's like the mentality needs to shift a little bit. I find like, uh, I feel like it, I hear a lot of like naysaying similar to when like the, what was it? Stop oil was throwing tomato soup at paintings and you go, Oh, well, what good is this doing? Well, well, what good is doing nothing doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And those paintings sucked. Um, <laughs> like, you know, I like people don't like seeing protest for some reason. They feel like it yeah. affects them. It's like it happened like 50 kilometers away from your house in the suburbs. Yeah. Relax. Um, second of <laughs> yeah, all, right. like, like I'm allowed to not buy something if I don't want to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. It's like, what happens to the free market? What happens? <laughs> like, this is, this is like an inherently like, uh, it's playing within the rules that were handed yeah. to these people. And they're like, oh. I can I can decide what is valid by using the purchasing power that is afforded to me through my the job that I work in this economic system that we've <laughs> we orchestrated. Um, so I'm not going to spend that here. And everyone's like, no, no, don't do that. You have to spend it here. <laughs> like I, it's they're even playing by the rules. They didn't do the the steal from Loblaws Day thing, which I they were freaking. I fully out endorse. Yeah. Yeah. It's like. <laughs> I, I think if you can't afford food um, and you need to you need to steal food to survive, I'm I'm going to take your side over the large Even store. Even if you don't the food. need to do it to survive, steal from stores, <laughs> you know, like I <laughs> fuck them. <laughs> they have. <laughs> listen, I, I'm not I'm not advocating any sort of crime <laughs> on your podcast, uh, but like I do think that all these stores they have a certain margin for shrinkage so that they can continue to make profits. Yeah. Um, I think that like, I'm not going to organize a steal from La Blah's day thing because then everyone's going to be like a radical activist journalist, <laughs> Eric Wickham said this, right. like, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, fair, like fair. I'm, I'm not going to fault people for being mad at a, a very large company. I think yeah. that's, um, that's like a waste of time to get mad at people trying to make their lives slightly better. No one's stealing for fun. You know? Right. Yeah. Like there's, and, I, and even if they are, I don't even care. Yeah. <laughs> well, <you know. laughs> Walmart can handle it. Loblaws can handle it. They'll be I fine. Th yeah. They're not going to notice the the missing tray of muffins. I yeah, don't think. That's like right. if we can be if we can be very honest. And then again, again, I'm not saying do that. <laughs> this is like me being a careerist. Yeah. Player. Yeah. Don't. <laughs> I, I, I don't speak that. for Eric. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But this is me not advocating that anybody does that. Yeah. The more I say that, the more it sounds like I am advocating for us. <laughs> it's a very confusing spot to be in. Eric Wickham does not endorse theft. Yes. It's actually <laughs> illegal. There you go. Don't do that. <laughs> now it's, that sounds so insincere when I say it now. Whoops. Yeah. Yeah. What are you going to do? Yeah.
you, you know, they can't take it out of context because tone is <laughs> is not allowed. <laughs> exactly. Well, nothing I've ever said has been taken out of context. So it's perfect. There People understand me perfectly when I talk. So it's great. Oh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> the only person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This will not blow up on my face and show up in a, in a job interview 10 years from now. I guess, uh, I know we're running low on time, but I wanted to ask you actually quick about, uh, labeled the, uh, the new food professor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Uh, did you have a specific question or should I just go on a tirade just, about it? How did that happen? Yeah. Go, oh. <laughs> go on your tirade. So, I mean, it's all coming from that, that Hoser project I mentioned briefly. Uh, I've been tracking the price of groceries in Toronto for the last 10 months. Um, I've been scraping them. I have built a system to uh, accept uh, user submissions from the community. I'm, I'm trying it out in uh, Kensington Market, which is a specific neighborhood in Toronto that has a lot of independent stores. And now I'm, I'm reaching out to like BIAs to try and get like local stores to start submitting data. I've been doing this with one store out in the east end of Toronto uh, called Raise the Root, which constantly sends me their, their spreadsheet of like their prices for the week. Okay. And we put it up on our website and we do some data analysis and we write some stories about that. But I've been doing this for a while. It's gotten a little bit of attention. I was on CBC not too long ago talking about uh, talking about my little project. Nice. Um, actually, when the, the boycott kicked off at the start of May, then I was, I was on TV in Vancouver talking about it as well. I'm here on your podcast talking about this stuff, being the new for, <laughs> the new food professor, <laughs> new food or professor. whatever. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I mean, for the folks at home who don't know who the food professor is, he is a very well known uh, talking head in the country. He talks yeah. about he likes to talk about food. He runs the Agri Food Lab or something. He's a professor out in Dalhousie. Um, like he's published a few papers on the supply chain. He is an expert in the supply chain, but I would argue that a lot of the stories about food are not supply chain stories. They're, I mean, <laughs> they're structural issue yeah. stories. They're stories about, um, about human beings not being able to afford uh, the, the food that they need to survive. Right. Yeah. Um, so, over the last couple months, I guess people have have started taking notice of the work that I've been doing. I went to a, went to a conference out in Ottawa a few months back, and Andre Goulet, who is the uh, executive director of the Harbinger Media Network and is on the steering committee of Unrigged, which I am as well. Actually, it's weird. I'm on steering committees now. It's so, it's so weird. <laughs> Seems but, very uh, grown up. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so. I'm not used to that, and. Uh, uh, if you ask, if anyone asks me if I'm on a steering committee, I'm going to say no, even though it's you're a truth. professional person. This is yeah, legit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, and the messy apartment behind me is just trying to throw <laughs> you off the scent. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like he had a Andre was on stage doing a panel about Unrigged, and I was recording it because I do a lot of production work. But he uh, he mentions the food tracker story, and then to a room full of. Uh, labor organizers and uh politicos <laughs> and other journalists and he refers to me as uh he either said the new food professor or the food professor of the left or, oh, there you uh, go. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> or the new food professor and then everybody stopped and looked at me and then clapped and then it's it's kind of stuck <laughs> since then but I, and you know it's like this weird thing because like i know i know the actual food professor probably does not appreciate this um this connection to me. Um, I'm sure he thinks I'm, I'm too small beans to actually worry about, but, uh, yeah, he, well, I don't know. He, he probably, he probably blocked you on Twitter or whatever, right? Like he spent, probably spent the time to be like, Hey, this guy is a guy I don't like. <laughs> well, it's, he, he blocked me for a bit. He unblocked me, um, a while ago. So like he's been, he's been kind of, a uh, um, an internet presence in my life for a lot longer than I, I expected <laughs> him to be. But Jeremy, Jeremy Appel, my colleague wrote a, a piece on his Substack, which is the orchard. Everyone should check it out. Actually. It's quite a good Substack. Um, and it's, the piece was called who the fuck is the food professor? He changed it to who the hell. Cause you know, he kept having to talk about it, yeah. but uh, he essentially goes into the food professor's um, 
interesting history as an academic. Um, and then I think the the big scoop in that was that he got a a grant for about sixty thousand dollars from the Western found uh, the Western Family Foundation for grad students, mm-hmm. right? And it's like this man is notably uncritical of specific companies, and then so yep. this story I think kind of start <laughs> that it might have might have uh... <laughs> nobody's nobody's saying he's corrupt, <laughs> but yeah, he may it, be biased. <laughs> It might have uh, stuck with people because yeah. even yesterday, um, uh, Dr. Lasagna, or the food professor as other people like to call him, um, was tweeting about how he's been a Toronto Sun columnist for about a year, unpaid. And he was like, he was congratulating them for never editing his pieces, which I didn't know how to tell him is like actually like a really bad sign for a newspaper if they're not editing yeah. anything about your piece. Like you're just your ideas are perfect, right out of the right out of the box. They're perfect. Don't your writing never it. has any errors. Yeah. You never missed a, pun- a punctuation mark. Yeah. Uh, nothing you said is uh, demonstrably untrue. Like Amazing. it just. I mean, he wrote that, and I retweeted it, and then uh, I was just like, "This is incredible." There's so many layers to this, um, because I mean, it's just it's a bad take, and people yeah. kind of jumped on it because people like to. Like the poke. That's what Twitter is for. Twitter. Yeah, it's for bullying. <laughs> it's for cyberbullying, and I don't feel good about it. But no, uh, no. <laughs> yeah, people just started sharing Jeremy's piece to me, and I'm on the podcast, uh, the podcast account. It's like Jeremy wrote that. Like, what do you do? <laughs> it's. So, yeah. I mean, I guess it's made us rounds to people that we don't even know. For sure. No, that's awesome. I I just had to ask about the the food professor thing because I remember hearing hearing about it. Yeah, it's, uh, I, it's a weird thing because I think it's funny, but I do think it's like it's going to mean like and I have to have like an uncomfortable conversation with him one day. Um, I'm hoping that he's just not going to want to talk to me. Yeah. But like yeah. if we do, then I'm going to have to be like, oh, you know, my friend Jeremy. Right. And he's going to be like mad. <laughs> yeah, oh, I know Jeremy. Like I don't want to have that conversation. Like, <laughs> yeah. For sure. uh, yeah. Well, I guess we'll cross that that bridge when we get there. You know? For sure. Well, I guess with that, where can people find you on the internet? Oh, well, I'm all over the place. I'm very online. I'm working from home these days. So um, you can find me on Twitter. We don't call it X in this household um, nope. because it's <laughs> that's a dumb name. <laughs> so we call it Twitter. I'm at ES underscore Wickham. You can listen to me on my podcast, Big Shiny Takes, if you love hating terribly written columns. Um, also, you can follow that on Twitter. It's at Big Shiny Takes. Listen to Tech Won't Save Us. Um, listen to Sources by Press Progress. Check out unrig.ca and go to the Hoser Grocery Tracker. So hosergrocerytracker.ca. You can see the dashboard. It's a working beta. I'm hoping to get a little bit more funding and maybe if I can build the model out the way that I want to, I can extend this um, very involved data project. I have 21 million price points in my database right now. Um, I would love to extend it to other cities. And so if you have, you know, a a couple thousand dollars lying around, you know, you're just like, what am I going to do with this? You know, before Trudeau can take it from the carbon tax or the capital gains (laughs) tax, tax. you give it to me and I can bring this project to your city. There you you go. Right on. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, I really appreciate your time and uh, have a good one, I guess. Yeah, we should do this again sometime. This is a blast. All right, folks, that's all for now. Thanks for watching or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends or on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it and it helps me keep the power on. Thanks to my top patrons, Damian Marie at Hope, uh, Some Random Geek, Justin Clark, Dan F. Smith, and Lisa Glass. And thank you to my new patrons. You can stay tuned for the list of patrons at the end to see your name listed. If you aren't a patron and want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can send a one-time donation to buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. I also have a Substack where you can subscribe for free or you can donate per month. And lastly, you can get a paid subscription on Spotify that will give you the same access to bonus content and extra long episodes. If you can't contribute financially, then I'd like on YouTube or a five-star rating on a, and a review on Apple Podcasts or one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser would be great. If you want to find more from me, then make sure to check out the show notes for links to all my stuff, 
or check out my link tree. Uh, it's linktr.ee slash skeptical leftist. That's where you can find all of my social media spaces and communities. You can also email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening or watching. Make sure to leave a comment on the video. Join your local org, print off some posters or pamphlets, and spread the propaganda. 